Good morning. Um, thank you for the invite here. Um, it seems strange for me that my talk today is about me. I don't really like talking about myself. But I have some very strange and weird stories about my life in martial arts. And some are fantastic, some are sad and some are scary. But it's been a very, very interesting career. I first started when I was young. Obviously, Bruce Lee was my, my idol. First thing I did was I bought two sticks, put a chain on, toilet chain, and started spinning them around. Um, didn't last too long because I got told off by my parents because I smashed so many light bulbs in the house. You know what it's like, everyone's done it. Swinging around, bang, light bulb's gone. Didn't last too long. Then I sort of like got into martial arts, different martial arts over a period of a few years. But as a young lad, different things came along. Ladies, drink, cars, usual thing. And then I got to 30. I used to play a lot of football. Then I decided I want to get back into martial arts at the age of 30. So now I've been doing martial arts for 27 years. Um, constantly. Started in kickboxing. I think it was um, Jean-Claude Van Damme came along with a kickboxer. I thought, that's it, that's for me. So for me, it was just a way of getting, keeping fit and learning a new skill. But unbeknownst to me, my life changed completely. And the things that have happened to me over the last few years have been, have been absolutely crazy. So today my talk is about the things that have happened to me. Obviously I went through the grades, got up to black belt, then I became uh, an instructor, I asked to become an instructor, which I did. Then I started teaching classes. Then I get an email, would you like to be in a book? Okay, sounds a bit weird. Okay, it's unusual. But I went with it. And it turned out to be an absolutely fantastic book. And it was the kickboxing handbook by a guy called John Richell. Lovely guy, smashing fella. And we did that over five days. I took a couple of students with me. And it was a great experience. Helped the guy change the book a lot because he was Hapkido based. But a few funny stories and sad stories as well. So I like to have a little bit of a laugh and joke as well. One of the stories where we had uh, Ger uh, John was German, and we called him German John, lovely fella. And we had a guy called Mark who was a little bit dyslexic. And John said to Mark, Mark, uh, kick me in the chin, uh, kick me in the chin. That's the way he spoke. And Mark goes, do you want me to kick you in the chin? He goes, yes. So Mark went, smack, kicked him in the chin. He went like that. He went, no, no, kick me in the chin, in the chin. So that was one thing. And on the last day, we did a little bit of self-defense stuff where he had to throw me and his lovely um, beige cords on. You know. Anyway, so he had to throw me. So he gets out and he throws me over and he would just... <coughs> and he ripped his trousers all the way down there. Of course, we was out in the sticks nowhere, but he found a staple gun. So he got little staples down his trousers, got on the train and went home. Unfortunately, John uh, lost his life a few years ago at the age of 44, um, doing a parachute jump in Germany, where he landed in a very high conifer, and still alive, but the, the rescue uh, crew came along and uh, did a stupid thing. They cut the branch above his head, and it hit him on the head, put him in a coma, and he died from that. So, unfortunately, we lost John. But I did, after the first book, I did another two books with John. Um, so, you know. That was a humbling experience to be part of that. And it's still a very popular book now. Now from that, um, I then came across a young lady called Stacey Cabman, who used to do a TV program called Cave Girl. I don't know if any youngsters don't, you know, remember that, but it's a children's program. So she came along and used to teach. Then she went and did a program called Mile High. Now on Mile High, she met this guy, who became her boyfriend. Anyway, this guy turns up to my class. And he's running around the hall like this. And he's doing somersaults. And this one, he's running off the wall doing a 360. I said, who's this guy then? He's a bit special, isn't he? It's Scott Atkins. Anyway, at that time, he had very, very small parts in different um, films, and the medallion with Jackie Chan, but it was small parts. And he, and he did mile hard because he wanted to learn a bit more acting. So... Then he asked me, can I take him on board to become an instructor? I thought, well, yeah, OK, yeah, no problem. So I trained him up. He did an instructor course and became an instructor for me. 
So I got him out teaching. And then he got asked to go and do a film called Undisputed 2 that might, some of you might, might know. And when he went off, he was a struggling actor at that time. He had not a lot of money. He lived in Acton. And he went off. About three months he went away. And he came back. But what I did, I looked after him. When I was teaching his class for him, I kept the money for him. And when he came back, I gave it to him. He said, you don't have to do that. I said, well, I want you to succeed. I want you to go where your dreams are. And if I can help you do that, I will. And my other profession at that time was a gardener. So actually, Scott actually came out and did a bit of gardening with me as well. So Scott was a, a gardener at the same time. So, but then from then on, he got asked to do Ninja. And then most of you know him, know where he is now. Um, Undisputed uh, 3, Undisputed 4, uh, Doctor Strange, Wolverine, Expendables 2. And he does about three or four films a year. Now he's a big, big Hollywood actor. So fair play to him. But it's always nice when I see him. Uh, I saw him a few years ago at the well, in a martial arts show with Michael J. White. And he introduced me. He said, this is my instructor, Dave. This is the guy who helped me when I was a poor man. And I'll never forget it. So that's what I like about Scott. He, he has never forgotten what I did for him. So it's very humbling for me. Then um, a couple of years later, I was doing a garden. And I had this guy singing. I thought, that's a bit bad. It's not very good, is it? Anyway. And I had this song, Tragedy. And I said, oh, I recognise this guy. It was Lee from Steps, Pop Group Steps. Anyone remember? Anyone know Steps? Yeah. They were singing away, so I got to know him. He was a karate black belt. So over a few years, he decided he wanted to have a go at martial arts. And from that, I brought him on now. He's a second degree black belt in kickboxing. Very good instructor. But from that, he, his father had diabetes. So we did a lot of work together, a lot of charity work together. We've done the London bike ride. We've done the London marathon, the Birmingham half, London 10K. And we cycled uh, London to Paris twice. So through martial arts, I've met these people. And it, for me, it's been quite inspiring. And it's strange, that I'm, I find it strange that I meet such um, great people that have succeeded in their profession. I found it very, very weird. Now, through the martial arts over the years, obviously, as we all know, you have to get all your qualifications. One of the things you have to do is your first aid. Very, very important part of martial arts. But through my first aid of martial arts and through my teaching, I've always been calm in certain situations. So as a gardener, now I'm a great believer in fate. Things happen for a reason. Now, I turned up to this lady's house that I've been doing her garden for seven years. And normally I used to turn up, I used to get my edging tool, edge a front lawn, cut a front lawn. Then I used to go out the back. I turned up this one day, beautiful day, sun was shining, no wind. And I saw the lady of the house, she was just about to get onto her phone to her sister. So she would have been on the phone to her sister for a very long time. Anyway, so she saw me, she came out, she's walking me around, she could talk for Great Britain. So I'm edging the front lawn. And the first time in seven years, I changed my routine. Then all of a sudden, the door, front door slammed. No wind, beautiful sunny day, 30 degrees, beautiful day. And I changed my routine. I said, right, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to go and do the back. I'm going to go and edge the back while I've got my edging shears. First time I've done it in seven years. So a house is like that. There's a, there's a corridor down an alleyway that takes you into the back garden. I walked down this alleyway. I got to the corner. And all of a sudden, I saw this. I looked again. It was her son, four years old, hanging by his neck on a washing line. The whirly gigs that go around. And what happened was he was playing action man. The chair went, he fell, he got his neck caught, and he spanned, he went round his neck twice. He was about a minute from dying. His bowels had gone. He's let go. His mum started screaming. I stayed calm. I ran over, I took the pressure off. But she couldn't get it off his neck. She was screaming her head off. I said, look, you hold him. So I passed him over. Then I got hold of the what, and I ripped it off. Don't know how I did it, I just ripped it off his neck. And it was hard wire. And all you heard was, <gasps> and the oxygen was going back in his body. 
We rushed him to hospital. I had, him, I had him on my lap. Obviously, I was a bit of a mess because he'd obviously let go. But it checked him out and he was fine. But I always think to that. I always, I'll never, ever forget that day, that image of that young lad hanging by his neck. And why did that happen? Why did that happen? And I can never, ever fathom out. Why did I change my routine? Why did I go turn up at that time of the day? If I wouldn't have been there that day, that boy would be dead now. The nice thing after that was it really got me. And it affected me for weeks because I kept thinking, why was I there? Why did I do this? Why did I change that? And I was weeding in the garden and he come next to me, four-year-old lad. And he looks at me and says, so are you helping me out today? He goes, yeah. I said, why are you helping me? Because you saved my life. And it got me right here. It got me right there. So that's one thing. Now, for that, I got nominated for a Pride of Britain Award, which was very, very special to be nominated. I didn't win it, but I was honoured to be a part of that. Um, again, fate again. I work in schools around London. I do a lot of anti-bullying, anti-street and life my kids, try and get them on the straight and narrow. Now, obviously with that, I have to do, again, first day stuff, child protection, or every, all the certificates that you need to teach in the school. Now, one thing that first aid doesn't teach you is anaphylactic. I don't know if anyone knows anaphylactic, what it is, allergies against peanuts, wash things, things like that. You can actually die from it very, very quickly. And I did this anaphylactic course. They asked me to come in, come into school, do this course, and I did it. And you saw all these pictures on, on the computer. And in two weeks later, I was teaching a class. And this young lad comes out of the toilet. And his face is all distorted to one side. And he's got bubbles like this, like bubble wrap all over his body. He goes, oh, I think I need to sit down, don't feel too well. Of course, I knew what it was straight away. From two weeks before. If I wouldn't have done that course, to be honest, I would not know what it is. Again, fate. Why did that happen? Why did they do that course? Why did that young boy get there? At that point, obviously, I knew what it was. I rushed him up to the medical room in the leisure centre I was teaching at. I asked him to call me an ambulance. At that point, the boy collapsed. His airway's going. He's starting to suffocate. I put him in the recovery position. He's never had this before in his life, so he didn't have an EpiPen, which gets the adrenaline in and gets you going again. The woman from the reception came out and said, I find the ambulance, and I told him he's got a rash. Can you take him down? You can imagine what I said. I was not happy. So I shouted out. I actually swore at her. Anyway, within 10 minutes, I had an ambulance, a motorbike ambulance and a big ambulance. All turned up. Got hold of him, rushed him into the ambulance and started injecting him with adrenaline in. The end story was that um, it was a combination of heat of the exercise and also he was allergic to prawns. He had a prawn curry that night and he's allergic to prawns. But now he carries an EpiPen with him all the time and he still trains with me today. Um, for that, I got um, a Hillingdon Hero Award from my local borough. So again, something else that's happened through martial arts training, that I stayed calm, the first aid, and I stayed calm. Now these days I spend my time teaching in schools around London. Um, not always easy with teaching kids. Some of the schools I go to are quite bad. And I've actually gone into schools trying to inspire them, trying to get them away from the, the, the crime that's going on, the knife crime. Um, there's a lot of talk about martial arts in schools. Should we be doing it? Should we be not? But for me, it's been quite successful. I've had some very good successful results from it. Walked into school one day. Young lad, 14, big lad, bigger than me, wider than me. I walked in there and he's going, punch him in the back. What you got, mate? What you got? I said, all right, pal. I'll show you what I got in a minute. Go and sit down over there. 25 kids. You could tell he was a school bully. And I got the nod from the teachers that he was a school bully. I said, come up here, pal. So he grabbed my shirt. So I grabbed his, he grabbed my shirt. I slapped him around the face. He went, like that. Then I got him in a lock and put him on the floor. He was going, ah, ah, ah. I said, you ask me what I got. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come out. Yeah, yeah, but oh, yeah, I can do this. I said, all right, do another one. So I did another one. I did a doorman's lock. Yeah, but I can touch you with it. I can punch you with that round. So I went like that. And he went, can you sing? He goes, no. He went, ah, 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 like that. Of course, all the other kids were laughing. Okay. But the good thing from that, but this was the school bully. Now, these courses that I do in these, some of these schools are five, six weeks or five or six sessions. The second session he came in, some of the other lads were talking, be quiet, be quiet, boys, I want to hear what Sensei's talking about. He ended up 
with the um, certificate for the best student on the course because it turned him around a little bit, made him think a little bit, got in his mind a little bit. And for me, that's more inspiring about getting into someone's head. Some children you will never get, ever get to as hard as you try, but some of them you can. Now that young lad is now an ambassador in the school. And given a positive um, outlook about the dangerous street and knife crime. Yeah. I've also done a very similar one up in London, um, a Tottenham football ground. Asked to go in there. I had 20 odd young lads from 11 to the age of 16. Not a great area, Tottenham, not a knife crime around Tottenham. So I said to these guys, just look, I'm not policeman. I said, how many of you actually carry a knife? The percentage was very, very high. It's about 80% of them carry knives. Why do you carry a knife? Well, because he does, or he does, or someone else does. It's to protect myself. But if you carry a knife, you're going to use it. It's no good. You're the one who's getting up and getting in trouble. And again, I heard two or three weeks later um, that the young lads have changed their attitude, not carrying knives. Now I've become more supportive of the local community, tried to get into a better lifestyle, were better at school. I went back three years later again. One of the lads who was on the course, well, actually it was two of them, they were now ambassadors looking after the younger ones, trying to inspire them through what I've taught them before. Now, like I said, I've always found my life very strange in my martial arts life. Yes, I've got all these Hall of Fames all over the world and all this sort of stuff. What do they mean? It just means I've got a award. But for me personally, it's about inspiring other people, inspiring my students and youngsters. I have youngsters that I've been teaching since the age of eight. They're now in their 30s and they're still with me today. So that is my message, is to try and inspire people, to try and lead a better life, the best life that it can. If they're struggling in life, trying to help them, trying to change them through the martial arts that I teach. Am I the greatest martial artist in the world? No, I'm not. I'm an average martial artist. Do I think I'm a good instructor? Yes, I do. My life is about helping other people. It's not about me. It's about helping others to succeed the best way they can. Thank you very much.